Tonight's program particularly celebrates uh, our bicentennial as it features Philip F. Gora, the author of this book, The American Antiquarian Society, 1812 to 2012, A Bicentennial History. This is literally hot off the presses, and Professor Gora will gladly sign copies after his talk. And this is actually the second in a special series of bicentennial publications that we have produced. The first volume is this one, entitled A Place in My Chronicle by Jack Larkin and Carolyn Sloan. It is a revised and newly contextualized transcription of the Journals of the Society's second librarian, Christopher Columbus Baldwin. Both books can be purchased here tonight. And these publications were created under the stewardship of our editor of publications, Carolyn Sloan. And I want to acknowledge the great work she has done to bring these volumes to fruition. We commissioned Philip Gura to write our history in part because of his wide-ranging interest in so many aspects of American cultural and intellectual life, from the Puritans to guitar makers to transcendentalists. Professor Gura is very much a Renaissance man of American studies. His variety of intellectual interests made him a wonderful candidate to tell the story of this institution, which has been so instrumental in a vast array of intellectual endeavors over the past 200 years. Professor Gura was also a wonderful choice because of his personal connections to both this area and to the society. He is a native of nearby Ware, Massachusetts, and received both his undergraduate graduate degrees from Harvard University. His very long involvement with the American Antiquarian Society began in 1971 when he first entered this building as a reader. He was elected to membership in 1988 and has held three separate month-long Peterson Research Fellowships in the academic years 1989-90, 1998-99, and 2002-03. He was also the Andrew W. Mellon Distinguished Scholar in Residence during the 2006-07 academic year. In the summer of 2004, he led our summer seminar in the history of the book in American culture. He has graced this podium many times, delivering many talks before our membership and the general public, including the James Russell Wiggins Lecture in the History of the Book in American Culture in 2004, and a memorable 2003 public program that described how he purchased on eBay what is likely the second known photograph of Emily Dickinson. When not part of the AES community, <coughs> Dr. Gurry is the William S. Newman Distinguished Professor of American Literature and Culture at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He has taught at UNC for 25 years and is the recipient of many awards for both his undergraduate <coughs> and graduate instruction. He is the author of many books on a wide variety of subjects, including The Crossroads of American History and Literature, America's Instrument, The Banjo in the 19th Century, C.F. Martin and His Guitars, 1796-1873, Jonathan Edwards, America's Evangelical, and American Transcendentalism, A History, which was a finalist for the National Book Critics Award. His latest work, Truth's Ragged Edge, The Rise of the American Novel, will be published in 2013. Please join me in welcoming back to the AAS book, Philip F. Burr. It is like coming home uh, to speak here. I've done it many times. It always seems it's a little warm, but I hear they're working on that. Uh, it's like writing about your family. Today I had to describe over 50 copies of books for the people who work here. It's hard to say something different about 50 people that I tried. Um, it's an honor to address you on this occasion, which as most of you know is the 200th year of this society's existence, uh, and an equal honor to have an asteroid the society's bicentennial history, which I began six years ago. I first learned of the society, uh, as you heard in 1971, when I was writing a college honors thesis uh, on the early history of Ware, Massachusetts, I had worked for two summers as an interpreter at Old Servant Village, but one of the counselors, uh, current counselors of this institution, Richard Rabinowitz, had been my college tutor when he had moved to Sturbridge as the new director of museum education. And one of our uh, August members and next council member, Barnes Riznik, was then vice president for museum administration. I also first met Carolyn Sloan at that institution. Uh, and as I use AA 
asked more, it was a joy to discover her in Worcester, where she has held increasingly important positions, now our editor of publications. By the way, uh, staff, I apologize for using that possessive hour. Well, I must feel like it's partly mine after what uh, I want to thank her for so much friendship and support uh, and so much important work on this project. I worked hard to make this book interesting, but indeed she worked even more so to make it as accurate and handsome as it is. Well, you're writing a history of what? People would say the what society? Antiquarian society? This has always been a problem for people. In 1940, the librarian, R.W.G. Vail, uh, noted that at least once a year someone asked to see the fish in what he hopes is a great American aquarium society. We are, he continued in his report, sometimes asked to identify rare fish and shells. And once in my memory a person brought a live turtle. <laughs> Correspondence to Vail was addressed American Antique Museum, American Antique Society, American Antiquated Society. <laughs> I like this, American Epicurean Society. American Antiquarian Church, which it is sometimes, to those of us who work here. Thank goodness no one wrote American Superannuated Society, but they did. November 19th, 2004, I was in Worcester to deliver the Wiggins Lecture. I arrived the night before and was surprised by a call from John Hitch asking if I would meet him and Ellen Dunlap for breakfast the next morning. I'd expected dinner after the talk, but not breakfast before. Adding to the mystery, we did not go to some hotel restaurant, but instead to one of Worcester's legendary diners on Shrewsbury Street. Over toast, eggs, and bacon, there was no tofu to be had in it. And through the smoke constantly coming off the grill, they popped the question, will I write it? I was genuinely surprised, for I had thought that someone within the institution would be asked to prepare such a volume. The more I considered it, the more excited I became, and within a couple of weeks, I accepted their offer. My thanks go to John and Ellen for having faith in my ability to do what they wanted and for making it financially possible for me to do so. It was a lot of work. Uh, now, the longer one is in the academy, the more he thinks that when he completes a manuscript, it doesn't need that much work. Well, we had a lot of cooks in this kitchen. By my tally, this manuscript was read by at least 12 readers. When you publish a book with the University Press, you think two people read it. 12 readers, uh, each of whom knew a lot more about certain subjects than I do. Working on the broth were such sous chefs as AA staffers Mark McCorrison, Tom Knowles, Ellen Dunlap, historians Dick Brown, Jane Kamensky, bibliographer David Wetzel, and aquarian book dealer Bill Reese, council member Jock Heron. It really is a wonder that we have a book here today, but it is, I can test, I think, quite savory. Of course, it was on the last two chapters dealing with people who are still alive and kicking that I received the most advice. <laughs> if I were a 19th century minister, I would have to choose a scriptural text on which to base my talk. Given the difficulty initially of trying to get a handle on this, I thought of Joel 115, I only escaped alone to tell thee. But instead I picked Genesis 6.6, 6. there were giants in the earth. And I wish to combine it with another quotation, which I wanted to use for the talk, for the uh, heading of this talk, but uh, uh, it's a bit esoteric, but most of you will get it easily, and that is, take the taters when the taters are passing. You ever heard that quotation? That was librarian <coughs> Vale's folk wisdom, and it means when the plate comes to you, you take what's on it before there's nothing left. And he thought that was great advice for librarians. Well, that uh, meant something to me as I thought about how I would structure this talk because arching over uh, what I'm saying is this interesting oxymoron. AAS has become what it is because for over two centuries, in order to carry out its mission to preserve the old, it has always had the courage to 
embrace the very, very new and to grab those potatoes, whether they be first editions of important writers or the newest forms of digitization. Emerson said an institution is but the length and shadow of a man, and AAS is the shadow, as most of you know of this remarkable founder, Isaiah Thomas. He was born in Boston in 1749. His father died when he was three, and his mother struggled to make ends meet. When he was six, Boston overseers of the poor placed him with Zachariah Fowle, a childless printer, on the promise that Fowle would take care of him and educate him. Thomas took to that work and soon became formally apprenticed to Fowle, who, used to, uh, who was to teach the boy, as the phrase was, the art and mystery of a printer and to read, write, and cipher. After a decade, they had a falling out, and Thomas ran off to Halifax, Nova Scotia, worked for a printer there at the height of the Stamp Act in Congress, then to Portsmouth, New Hampshire, then to Woman, to North Carolina, where he tried unsuccessfully to get backing for a press. In 1770, the year of the Boston Massacre, at the age of 21, he returned to Boston and persuaded Fall to make him a partner. In the paper they started, the Massachusetts Spy, Thomas showed the colors for the Patriots' cause, and by the summer of 1774, as matters with enlightenment with England deteriorated, Thomas's friends urged him to move from Boston for his safety. Thus, on April 15, 1775, a few days before the Battle of Lexington and Concord, is that today? Is for 19? Yes, sir. Uh, he took apart his press, ferried it, and his type across the Charles River, and then carted the material 45 miles inland uh, to, uh, to Worcester, uh, where his trade was safe from British confiscation. After the Revolution, he expanded his increasingly successful business until he became quite literally the most successful printer in the United States. But all this is preliminary to tonight's story. For in 1802, at the age of 53, he transferred most of his printing business to his son. At that point, Thomas was worth about $200,000, no insignificant amount. And like another famous printer born in Boston, Benjamin Franklin, he took early retirement, cultivated other projects for the public good. What led directly to AAS was his scholarship for in 1810, having for years sought out rare examples of American and European printing, published a two-volume history of the art that never has become obsolete. It was reprinted later in the 19th century and indeed uh, reprinted again, I believe, in the 1970s. He realized that he should preserve the kinds of materials gathered for that work and early in 1812 thought of an institution for that purpose. By summer's end, he had enlisted prominent Worcester citizens in deliberations about what he now called, let me get it right, the American Antiquarian Society and petitioned the legislature for formal incorporation. Its purpose was different from the recently founded Massachusetts Historical Society and the New York Historical Society, for AAS was not intended, as he wrote, for the particular advantage of any state or section of the Union, or for the benefit of a few individuals, but rather was to foster inquiry into American antiquities largely conceived, a, a national institution like no other in existence at that time. He wished to locate it in Worcester so that its treasures might be safe from destruction by foreign invaders. This was during the War of 1812, and such a threat was in fact real. Governor Caleb Strong signed the Act of Incorporation on October 24th, and by deed, Thomas conveyed all his treasured books, newspapers, and broadsides to the society, forming the core of its collections. He also knew that an institution needed not just books, but bricks and mortar, and in 1817 donated both land and money for the society's permanent home. Thomas danced delicately around what he clearly understood as his new society's chief rival, our friends over in Boston on Boylston Street. Massachusetts Historical Society, a competition that I trust at least is somewhat of Bacon. When the Salem minister and antiquary William Bentley was disappointed at the poor turnout at one of the early antiquarian society meetings, he attributed the jealousy from the local members of MHS. In his diary, he observed, 
the historical society is jealous of a competition. It is the opinion of some of the men of the historical society who wrote that Thomas will have the honor of his wishes, that is, he would be recognized uh, for his lofty aims. And yet, he said, he hoped AAS might fail and so fall back to the historical society which can embrace its objects. And I puzzled over that last phrase. Did he mean its objects like the rare books here, or did he mean its loftier objectives? I never could quite get a handle on it, but anyway, uh, MHS uh, was thinking about such things. To his credit, Bentley got behind Thomas and put many of his rare books at the service of the new society, even though he lived in that other area. Among them, one book that made Thomas delirious with joy. I know that some of you here are, uh, in fact, book collectors, various different sorts, so I've sprinkled little tidbits like this in for you for salvation. He wrote, after advertising for another copy of this book and making inquiry in many places in New England, Thomas wrote, I was never able to obtain or even hear of another copy. Little wonder he was given the now legendary Bay Saw book printed, uh, the, the first book printed uh, in the continental United States and of course the cornerstone of any great, great American collection. As his relationship with Bentley suggests, over the course of his life, Thomas continued to gather what in retrospect seemed even more extraordinary items from this, for the society. Let me tell one tale about his opportunism as the taters were passing. Hannah Mather Crocker, granddaughter of Cotton Mather, had taken an early interest in the society and had placed with it several pieces of family memorabilia, including her great-grandfather Increase Mather's whetstone, subsequently used by Cotton Mather to write the Magnalia Christi Americana, a large and important book. A tobacco box given by Sir William Phipps to Increase Mather with the claim that once it belonged to Sir Walter Raleigh. I don't know if that, in fact, is proved. Thomas knew that Crocker had many other printed manuscript treasures, a few of which he already had given to the Mass Historical Society. And in November 1814, following up on her evident interest in the new society, Thomas uh, went to her uh, to ask if she might be willing to part with more items. He sealed the deal, created up four generations worth of the Mather family materials for the trip to Worcester. In addition to the entire family library of printed books and pamphlets, he acquired hundreds of letters and manuscripts, including, hard to imagine, but it sits behind those doors, a 1648 manuscript copy of the Cambridge Platform in Richard Mather's hand, Increase Mather's manuscript autobiography, Cotton Mather's medical treatise, Angel of Bethesda. Evidently pleased with his visit, he paid the night a considerable sum of $700 for this material. Hannah Crocker later donated additional materials, including the portraits you see here up on your left of the Mather family descendants and other, uh, other notables. Before I leave Thomas, let me offer one more kind of tidbit, uh, a little something that I did not expect to learn. The esteemed Mr. Thomas seemed to have some questionable indulgences. A former apprentice wrote that while living with Thomas's family, uh, he was there exposed to much temptation. Mr. Thomas, he continued, being an ungodly man and no member of that family pious, all his apprentices have become profane. But he continued, <laughs> this man who escaped these clutches, but I was able to resist temptation and was kept by the good providence of God from bad and vicious habits. I never uncovered just what it was Thomas was doing. I suspect it may have had something to do with his being a Unitarian. <laughs> During Thomas's lifetime, the project was to get the organization started and on a sound footing. After his death in 1831, the project evolved. Next, one had to continue to build collections by donation, and that toward that end to broadcast far and wide its reputation as a repository. This work fell into the society's first full-time librarian with the appropriate name, Christopher Columbus. Baldwin was a Worcester County son, trained as an attorney by the renowned Levi Lincoln. He was good at law, but always displayed an antiquarian bent. His true vocational opportunity came soon after Thomas's death. I'm a candidate for the librarian of the Antiquarian Society, Baldwin wrote in his marvelous diary. 
and I'm anxious lest I be outwitted and another person get the place. He became utterly devoted to his job, even foregoing any thought of marriage. An antiquary should not pester himself with a wife. He wrote to a friend, he should do nothing that may diminish his affections or venerable books. You know, he continued, we cannot serve two masters, much less two mistresses, and my mistress is my profession. Baldwin's most important work was his indefatigable letter writing to secure new material for the collections. His impeccably kept letter books record correspondence, hundreds of inquiries, in which he explained the society's purpose and asked for donations. He wrote the American Education Society. He wrote to a potential donor in the new town of Cleveland for early newspapers. He wrote the Secretary of the American Colonization Society for early reports from Liberia. And on and on, letters went to friends, town historians, editors, members of Congress, genealogists, naturalists, amateur anthropologists, all over the nation. Some of these missives were whimsical, like the one to the wife of his friend, Joseph Willard. He suggested, writing to his friend's wife now, that she, quote, go into the husband's office and as you enter the door, cast your eyes upon the shelf of the bookcase that stands on the left side. There she would find, he wrote, several thin folio volumes placed one over the other. Take a brush, remove the dust, he instructed her, and she would find on a title page of one of them, the books of the general laws and liberties of Massachusetts Bay, printed in Cambridge, 1649. He urged her to take the precious volume, do it up carefully to napkin, and send it to him quickly. <laughs> How happy we then shall be, he wrote. <laughs> Not hearing back, he wrote to his friend Willard, asking if a confidential communication to his wife had accidentally fallen into his hands. <laughs> Some things panned out spectacularly for him. In the oppressive heat in the summer of 1834 on the fourth floor of an India Street oil warehouse in Boston, he hit the jackpot. The building's owners had allowed septuagenarian Thomas Walcott, an eccentric book collector and antiquary, Store his library there prior to dispensing it to his beneficiaries. He was quite old. Baldwin knew of the collection and had been in contact with Walcott's heirs, whom he persuaded to make the society the new home of whatever seemed important. As he rifled through his hero ancient trunks, bureaus, chests, baskets, tea chests, old drawers, I could hardly persuade myself it was not a dream, he wrote. He went back every morning five days and loaded a wagon for Worcester with 4,500 pounds of books and pamphlets, a cargo he considered the most valuable collection of the writings of early New England ever assembled with the possible exception of the early 18th century clergyman Thomas Prince's library. Baldwin estimated the number of books and pamphlets at 10,000. Before he left the city, he went to Walcott's home to thank the old gentleman. And the man said, well, take whatever else you want from the house. <laughs> Baldwin writes, I hardly saw anything which was less than 200 years old. And he selected several hundred volumes. His eyes bulged when he saw a bound volume of pamphlets with the initials CM on it. Crescentius Mather, as an increase, Connor Mather's father. Walcott's nephew told him to take it. But at this, old Walker drew the line, wanting both to keep the valuable volume for himself to protect him from any future want. <laughs> well, that was fine, because from the warehouse, Baldwin already had picked up one of Cotton Mather's manuscript diaries to join the others that had been brought here by Thomas, uh, as well as many other treasures. Unbelievable, when Baldwin returned to Worcester, he got a cool reception. When he appeared before the council at its next meeting, one of the council members who had some hostility toward him, that's his word, hostility, said he thought Walcott's donation was of little value, quote, and complained about the expense money the society had forwarded Baldwin for the trip. At the next meeting, member, uh, 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 I'm sorry, the next meeting member and Baldwin supporter Samuel Jennison set things straight, explained to the council the nature of this treasure. This was the first time, but not the last, 
hear about it later, when a council member had to defend the librarian's seemingly extravagant acquisition. <laughs> News of Baldwin's coup soon got around. John Farmer, a New Hampshire genealogist and state historian, said his congratulations, but was puzzled why Walcott, an original member of the Massachusetts Historical Society, did not deposit the materials there. Uh, where was important member Joseph Willard during all this, he asked Baldwin. Did he, now writing to Baldwin, did he consent to remain passive while Baldwin bore off the prize? There must have been a little bargaining if there was no corruption, or you must have been quite an adroit diplomatist, he wrote. Uh, it must have been the latter, for I could find no proof of any corrupt bargain. He simply had again gotten there first. Baldwin also commenced the custom of exchanging uh, a duplicate with other libraries, including the Boston Athenaeum. He went there in 1831, examined their pamphlets, and brought many hundreds home, confessing, though, that he found them uh, uh, in great disarray and, and fully uncatalogued. He understood, and this is an important point, that a library's final usefulness related to knowing what is in it, uh, and so to do just such careful cataloging of what Thus, by 1832, he had begun to create such a catalog for all the society's holdings, both of the library and the cabinet, as the collection of artifacts was called. What tidbit can I offer you about this fascinating man? In May 1832, the council noted that the library recently had suffered from depredations committed by insects, particularly the fur bug that fed on leather and attacked newer books. Baldwin was quite upset. He wrote Thaddeus Mason Harris, the librarian of Harvard College, who, as Baldwin wrote, has a prodigious fondness for bugs, but no sort of friendship for his present duties, meaning his librarianship. And he set along some examples of the fur bugs. If it will not give you too much trouble, I should like that you should instruct me in the habits and manners of these little vermin, he wrote. Perhaps I do them injustice in calling them vermin, but the difficulties they have caused me are too great to be borne patiently. What Harris, the author of an important study of entomology of Massachusetts, suggested I never learned, but Tom Knowles assures me the fur bugs have been exterminated. <laughs> Before Baldwin could complete his catalog, tragedy struck. In the summer of 1835, Suffering from overwork, he needed a break from his virtually incessant labors. Like Thomas, he was fascinated by American antiquities, and the council generously funded a trip to the Ohio River Valley so that he could examine Indian burial mounds. On August 20th, traveling on the Cumberland Road from Wheeling to Zanesville, Ohio, he died instantly when his stagecoach's horses became frightened and the vehicle overturned. He was buried near Norwich, Ohio, his diary and other belongings forwarded to the society. Councilor John Davis said it all, this tragedy was an irreparable loss to the society. The council did not rush to replace him and installed Matcher and Fisher, a Brown graduate and lawyer in Worcester as interim librarian, while they searched for a successor, a search that took three years. Not that they didn't have applicants for the job. One who sought the post was the poet and bibliophile James Percival Gates of New Haven. Now these were the days before headhunting firms, and Percival unabashedly put himself forward for the job, writing, I am extensively known in our country as a man of genius and an eminent poet. <laughs> but he was also extensively known as an eccentric who lived in a three-story house in New Haven, crammed with thousands of books and reputedly only a single chair. Further, because the position entailed greeting visitors, his personal appearance left something to be desired. Percival always wore the same threadbare green coat with pantaloons to match, and also old shoes, and had long hair parted in the middle and hanging straight down on either side. As if this were not enough to kill the nomination, a frank referee squashed his hopes. From his peculiar temperament, this honest man wrote the council, it's impossible to say how he will get along with others, but if you can be content to take an ill-dressed, shabby-looking man of awkward manners and sensitive feelings, Percival's your boy. <laughs> On April 18th, 
38 Samuel Foster Haven, whose portrait is directly behind you there. Depiction. A recent widower with one son began tenure as librarian that lasted 43 years. A Dedham native and attorney, Amherst graduate, he was something of a local historian. Like Baldwin, he could not believe his good luck uh, when he acquired the position and took seriously his, uh, his task of building the collections, uh, both uh, uh, and of uh, opening them to the public. In these years, the society was becoming a must-see for visitors to the Worcester region. And many came to see uh, not just the books, but the cabinet, as it used to be called. What a cabinet. I'm sure some of you wish it were all still here. In addition to Bentley's bequest of the Mather paintings, the cabinet, which was a, it took up a whole room, included obviously shells, to go along with the fish, I suppose, minerals, colonial coins and currency, Native American artifacts, a tall clock belonging to John Hancock, a bottle of tea, which we still have, gathered on the beach at Dorchester Point just after the tea party, an apple from a tree in Marshfield planted by Peregrine White, the first white man born in New England. Haven had to humor those who deposited even less appropriate items. A moose horn, snowshoes, shoes worn by Madame Usher, prominent Boston matron, in 1690, a snuff box made from an elm tree in Northampton minister John Edwards' yard. There was a piece hard to believe, of wainscoting from a room on the island of St. Helena in which the Emperor Napoleon had died. The bones of a British grenadier disinterred at Bunker Hill, and the Indian hatchet that was found sticking in the head of Sergeant Caleb Chapin of Burnston, who was killed by the French and Indians September 8, 1755. But the most popular exhibit was the mummified remains of a child found in a cave. Member David Ward of Ohio was charged with delivering this treasure to Worcester, but he was delayed because in all the larger towns and cities he stopped to display the curiosity, showing it for a fee. Eventually, it got as close as Ethan Allen Greenwood's Boston Museum, where it joined such displays as live animals, including a duck billed platypus, wax figurines, and the Fiji mermaid. All this aside, painting by John Singleton Copley, Gilbert Stewart, and Benjamin West, all sitting in the Boston Museum. Not a fine art, this is the Boston Museum. Thompson sent member Benjamin Russell to Boston to get the darn thing. When Russell saw it, he wrote back disgustedly, I've seen a dead cat which was accidentally enclosed in an oven and found some months later as in, good, in as good a state of preservation as this skeleton. It made its way to Worcester, and was a favorite display, leaving briefly to be exhibited through at both the Centennial Exhibition of 1876 and the Columbian Expedition, uh, Exposition of 1893. We finally, I think it was a good deal, traded it to the Smithsonian for some uh, other artifacts. <laughs> but Haven was no uh, early P.T. Barnum. He identified the collection's needs and actively solicited appropriate donations. Manuscripts were particularly important to him, and one coup, for example, was the early 17th century letter book of John Hull, one of Boston's early settlers. But think of how Haven felt when he heard, after inquiring about the book's source, that a Mr. Ridgway, who had found a large quantity of such old papers in his attic and rescued this item, was using the material to kindle fires in the Ridgeway told Jennison that he could have anything else he wanted, but when he arrived, the roof of the attic had already been raised, the hole cleared out, and all these papers were destroyed. Never given this. Like Thomas, he had an enlightened and broad view of what mattered. Collect the acts and doings of all minor institutions, he told members in 1855, whether civil, religious, literary, or political. Soon enough, this included anything to do with the Civil War as well. Uh, in which, by the way, he lost his uh, only child. He was particularly worried about one of its unforeseen side effects. With paper mills offering high prices for any old pamphlets and books that could be ground up for manufacture of new paper. He urged society members to go to such mills and examine the stock and to select books at their own expense uh, if the material was too valuable to be destroyed. 
And there was yet another unforeseen result of this odd development. So frequently did, as uh, he wrote, this choice, the, the choice productions of the press pass from inappropriate owners or custodians to the rag gatherers' bags, book dealers listened, that a class of middlemen had arisen who found it profitable to intercept these accumulations on the way to the mill and subject them to careful scrutiny and then sell to a growing cadre of private collectors. Here, of course, we have, for the first time, mentioned in A.S. Annals, what became essential, the ferreting book scout. Heaven's greatest, Heaven's greatest opportunity to add to the Society's collections came with the death in 1875 of the great collector in Hartford, George Brindley. By the terms of his will, he provided in certain institutions, which he considered important, money from his own bequest uh, to buy at auction items from his collection and gave the Edward Society $5,000. The auction took five lengthy sessions, not completed, from 18 until 1893, and the Society purchased hundreds of rare items uh, from that sale. Uh, this is important because it, it really marks uh, the first time uh, that the society began to purchase books with a particular kind of aim or ambition rather than just accepting them uh, by donation. Haven's accomplishments were a legion in cataloging, uh, an activity also encouraged by the increasing professionalization of librarianship. This is an interesting uh, anecdote. In 1853, Charles Jewett of the Smithsonian tried to raise support for a visionary plan for printing the catalogs of all the country's libraries to comprise a sort of what's called a union catalog. If you ever get to look at all these large green books in the back, that's the National Union Catalog, hundreds and hundreds of volumes. Well, he thought of an idea like this in 1853. Under his plan, each library would prepare its catalog on stereograph plates and simply add new acquisitions on new plates. Periodically, each library would send these to the Smithsonian uh, and the Smithsonian would print these off to keep the nation informed of, in a sense, the total output of, 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 of the total collection of books uh, in the nation. Um, for the moment, Jewett's project did not go far, but his belief that all librarians should at least follow a set form of cataloging rules as they prepare these plates soon enough bore fruit in Melville Dewey's decimal system, copyrighted in 1876. You all remember the Dewey decimal system by which you're During the years of Haven's tenure, Boston Athenaeum librarian Charles Folsom proposed what became another breakthrough for library users, a card catalog. It consisted of a series of punched paper slips on a string. If you flip the cards in that, they hadn't actually gotten the box for them far that day. Let me end my few words about Haven with two bittersweet stories about the ones that got away. December 1840, an out-of-town visitor checked into the Temperance Hotel in Worcester. John James Audubon was touring the eastern U.S. to gather subscriptions for his monumental Birds of America. Friends in the Boston area had alerted Haven to the visit and asked him to show the ornithologist the society's collections and to entertain the possibility of buying a book, buying some books. Settled at his hotel where he was quite chagrined, he wrote in his diary, not to be able to get a glass of wine. Well, what did he expect? He called on his agent, Clarendon Harris, who was to introduce him to people in town. Audubon found the librarian of antiquaries, that's what he called Haven, a learned and pleasant person and enjoyed visiting Antiquarian Hall. Haven sent him off to visit with another famous citizen, Elihu Burrett, uh, following which he expected Audubon to return to the hall for business. But after calling on Burrett, Harris then took Audubon over to see attorney Isaac Davis, and they sort of went visiting. Uh, and finally, Audubon got to take a few glasses of wine. By the time they got to Antiquarian Hall, Audubon wrote, Mr. Haven was gone, and we, not having been punctual with him, thereby lost a potential subscriber. Would Haven have subscribed? Probably not, but we still in this building do not have a copy of the double elephant folio of Audubon's Birds of America, uh, simply out of the question for any institution um, through Cora these days. 
And here's a little gossip that didn't make it into the history. You're going to tell you a few things that didn't make it in. One of Haman, part of it didn't know. One of Haman's visitors in 1841 was a 19-year-old budding transcendentalist called Carolyn Healy, visiting relatives in the city. They took her to Antiquarian Hall, where she engaged the young widower, his wife had died before he took the job. He had raised his son himself. Uh, or he engaged the young visitor, or the widower rather, in a discussion of, among other things, faith. Oh, the transcendentalists were always talking about faith, so that was something they could get along on. I could hardly see what interested me most here, the young woman wrote. There were many things, all the old pictures and engravings, and the library. <laughs> the meeting escalated into a dalliance. Her relatives buttered up Haven by sending him some cigars. He yeah, evidently loved to smoke. And even engineered to leave her alone with him one afternoon, a breach of the usual propriety that neither seemed greatly to mind. On another occasion, the conversation turned to beauty, a woman's ambition, she wrote. And finally, it turned to love. My journal, she wrote in her diary, has good reason to know how gladly I got off this subject and onto something else. Alas, nothing came of this relationship, and mysteriously, she destroyed all the letters that came from him. We have so many of Margaret Healy's materials in Boston, and the letters from him are not there. So who knows what was going on? By the 1870s, many of Haven's tasks had been given over to Edmund Barton, who finally assumed the librarianship in 1883. He remained in that position until 1908, except for Baldwin. Uh, most of these people who I'm speaking of held these positions for an amazingly long time, decades and decades. Uh, which speaks to the, to the wonder of working here, I must say. That's my own private view. There's nothing better than working. When someone leaves, <laughs> you wonder what's wrong. Uh, he had worked with Haven for 15 years as his assistant, and so the transition was seamless. Haven had charged him with preparing shelf lists and a card catalog. At one point, uh, he who took his work for research, he wrote, it is sometimes asked whether ours, and I'm sure some of you asked this, whether this is a public or a private library. To this question, I answer, uh, it is a private library for the public good. He created an environment that incorporated the concepts of service espoused by the newly formed American Library Association, with his staff, particularly Mary Reynolds, providing effective reference help to any scholar who visited. But while Barton was good at daily administration, he was not a scholar and was reluctant to put himself forward in the ways his predecessors had, particularly in terms of adding things to the collections. More and more members of the council grew restive about the way things were going. The problem is relating to both collections uh, uh, the collections of the books and the kinds of leadership required to manage them were on people's minds. Too many gaps had occurred and there would seem no reliable way to fill them. A result from the dependence, as I had mentioned, of random donations rather than targeted line. Councilman John Washburn felt the society was falling behind in usefulness because of gaping holes in the collections, pointing to the recently founded New England Historic Genealogical Society's local history collection, which he claimed already was better than that at AAS. We have a great and aggressive name, Washburn continued, but are not maintaining it. How, if proudly claiming to be national, we should prove in the end merely provincial? Perennial, perennial comment, I think. He urged the creation of a large fund for library purchases and the hiring of an intellectual leader whose title, this is a great list, should be called Director, Superintendent, Regent, Censor, or Rector, a person characterized by his intellectual presence and dignity, this is he writing, his love of and devotion to the studies of the society, his high personal character. But nothing much happened. During the 1890s, this debate about the society's direction continued along generational lines with such luminaries as Edward Everett Hale, Justin Windsor, Charles Dean, and Nathaniel Payne, who were the grand old men of the society, and more forward-looking members like Washburn, Clark University's eminent psychologist, G. Stanley Hall, and others wanting, as they called it now, a secretary of publication and research. 
Well, old Barton was a great hanger-on, and before we leave him, uh, let me offer one amusing anecdote about him. One task that he had been asked to do at Haven's bidding was the retrieval, again, librarians picture this, the retrieval of materials loaned to others, but never yet returned. <laughs> Those of you who have worked in this building know that nothing ever gets out of this building. Well, think of this. At one meeting, Barton reported that he had succeeded in retrieving nothing less than the platform of the Synod of Cambridge 1649 and that of 1671, the propositions of the Synod of 1662, and the life of Richard Mather of Dorchester 1670. It boggles the mind to think these were loaned out to people who wanted to use them, and then that he suggested that now it was safe to return them because the U.S. mails were more, <laughs> were more uh, properly run and the, the uh, institution had just installed a larger mailbox. So you could mail back your Cambridge platform and it would fit in whatever box we had, wherever that was. The turning point to the society's realignment as a truly great institution began after the death in 1905 of Stephen Salisbury. Am I right here? Yeah, uh, on, my, on your right. Uh, Stephen Salisbury II, who left a bequest that included very valuable land for a new building, all his books and artifacts, and the immense sum of $200,000. Uh, he also, of course, was a benefactor of other uh, public institutions in Worcester. Coincidentally, at this juncture, the society also had begun thinking ahead of a new, pres uh, to a new president, and in 1907, the young and vigorous prominent local resident, Walwell Lincoln, assumed that position, wishing to install someone who would follow the advice of prominent librarians whose ideas Lincoln had solicited. Uh, Lincoln consulted with council member J. Franklin Jameson, who recommended a promising young and ambitious librarian bibliographer, Clarence Saunders Brigham, then working at the Rhode Island Historical Society. Things, as they say, would never be the same. I must say something here a little unusual uh, too. Uh, as you heard, I grew up in Ware, Massachusetts, and one of my classmates, I, I never knew this until I began working on this kind of stuff, one of my classmates was Waldo Lincoln. And uh, Waldo Lincoln, that young fellow, not my age, young fellow, is uh, indeed related to the same family here. They just moved over to Ware. Uh, and I said, how do you ever get that word name, Waldo Lincoln? Now I know. Tied up with the Worcester Group, the Antiquarian Society. Well, in any event, uh, I will, I never knew Brigham, some of you here, I don't know if there's anyone here who still was alive when Brigham was alive here. Uh, probably there are. But well, anyway, I will call him Briggs. I will call him Brig, uh, as many people did. It's, it, it takes us away a syllable and it makes the talk flow. Jameson, earlier, Jameson had boosted the young scholar for the Rhode Island Historical Society job. And the letter he wrote concerning it, this is one of the great lines, was as candid as helpful. He's writing, uh, Jameson, who is president of the American Historical Association, is writing a letter to Brigham about his application to Rhode Island Historical The librarian of a historical society, he told him, ought to be an exceedingly and unusually and most scrupulously polite man. Why? Because the class of people from which money is expected are hardly to be won at all unless the librarian, who to their minds represents the society as a man of polished manners and invariable courtesy. Assuring Brig that he was a good fellow with a kind heart and an obliging disposition, Jameson reminded him that he was not so thoughtful and observant of the minor elegances and refinements of matters as he often should be, especially giving him a matters lesson. Just unbelievable. Uh, but, as most of you know, he succeeded greatly in his position. His success at AAS suggests that he took the advice. Uh, I never had the pleasure of meeting him, uh, but from all accounts, uh, he was as at home at the Worcester Club as he was here in Antiquarian Hall. Lincoln and Brigham formed an incredible partnership. An accomplished genealogist and book collector, Lincoln appreciated Brigham's already established talents in book collecting and biographical scholarship. 
When he arrived in society, he had already published five books. He was a young man, his 20, late 20s. With Brigham in place, Lincoln turned his attention to the design and construction of a new building that the Salisbury Request made possible, the cornerstone of which was laid in 1909. You're sitting in that building today. He took great interest in the construction, visiting the work site virtually every day, and taking photographs to document the entire progress of his construction. It was completed in time for the annual meeting in October of 1911. Brigham transformed the society. He set a collecting goal of, uh, of uh, getting everything printed in the United States before a certain date and chose 1820 as a cutoff because that year he said covered the establishment of printing presses in most of the older towns and also included the mass of printed material bearing upon the Jeffersonian era of the War of 1812 and the ensuing period of national reorganization. It also was the closing date originally chosen by his friend Charles Evans for his comprehensive American bibliography by then complete through 1778. Brigham saw the time when, as he put it, so large a, pro a proportion of the productions of the early American press will be on our shelves that the collecting of the future will be devoted only to the search for a few rarities. And interestingly, if you know the uh, full uh, history of the society, as those things become so rare and basically unobtainable because there, there aren't extant copies seemingly, uh, the society has moved further forward uh, and, and now has as its established cutoff date things uh, before 1876, not just 1820. He also wanted to strengthen other areas that already were notable, newspapers, almanacs, colonial laws, gift books. With the co council's blessing, he built up these areas and deaccessioned the remnants of other collections, including that famous cabinet. It was he who got rid of all those silly little things, except for that little thing of tea and a few others. That we he relied heavily on bibliographies and checklists, as well as booksellers, catalogs, and auctions records, auction records, which he studied tirelessly. He worked on what became his monumental bibliography of American newspapers to 1820, a project that he began in 1913 by publishing an installment in the proceeding behind me here, and which was not completed to his satisfaction until 1947. It's an understatement to say that Brigham's reputation as a collector was legendary. One example suffices. One year he purchased in nearby Oakham a cache of 68 pristine children's books printed by Isaiah Thomas. These, of course, are the most rare because children read them to death, so to speak. They're read to tatters. These were as though they came from the books. There were a few duplicates, including of the excessively rare 1794 mother books. He offered the duplicates to the great Philadelphia collector, A.S.W. Rosenbach, for more than he had paid for them all. The one condition, he wrote to Rosenbach, is that they should go into your collection and not at public sale during your lifetime. Suspecting Rosenbach might find that a bit restrictive, he said, well, he wrote another thing, well, I should not be happy to see the mother goose go into auction room, into the auction room and go to a high figure then have the person from whom I bought the collection descend on my neck for not giving him more. So please tell him, in other words, when the thing was going to be hung up for auction. I don't know if he meant that he would buy them beforehand or not. Uh, but anyway, he said that he did wrote the less said about this transaction, the better. Brick was deeply involved in this world of compulsive collecting. He acted as the personal overseas agent for Henry Huntington. Library in California when he was scouring London bookshops. He found great things for Huntington, but the two unfortunately fell out over what the patron regarded as some creative bookkeeping with the funds he had advanced to Brig, which to my mind seems perfectly legitimate and not at all problematic. But anyway, Huntington didn't like what he had done. He also set out to obtain first editions of all American authors, uh, a category in which the society had not been uh, collecting heavily. He developed a close relationship, as I mentioned, with Charles Evans, who did much of his work on his great bibliography at AAS. Brigham even loaned him $1,000 to help publish one of his volumes. Brigham's initiative at AAS uh, continued uh, by supporting the Dictionary of American Biography, sponsored by the American Council of Learned Societies. 
uh, and he allowed his staff to work on these projects uh, and not simply to be painting books from the back. Lincoln, in the meantime, tried to put this institution on sound financial uh, footing. Um, he took the radical step of hiring one of the nation's first professional public relations firms, John Price Jones Corporation of New York, to devise a marketing plan through which to approach prospective donors at the national level. I think it's fair to say that up to that point in the, in the 20s and 30s, this was very much, uh, in terms of the support I received, a Worcester institution. And it is, in the large measure, still a wonderful jewel uh, for the, those who uh, live in this area. Uh, in any event, uh, Lincoln realized maybe we should go national in this way. Some of the firm's staffers visited Worcester, selected interesting historical materials, prepared, prepared news releases to test the waters for publicity. They also developed a long-range uh, fundraising plan. In the end, the society did not retain them because the cost of their, their cost for the campaign was estimated itself to be $30,000, a huge amount. Lincoln decided to pursue the funds in his own way, relying on the tried and true method of soliciting Worcester area sources, delaying the time the society would have to plunge into that larger pool. Overall, members applauded Lincoln's decision. George Parker Winship, for example, dismissed Price Jones as charlatans, his words, a body of hot air artists carefully trained to convince clients that all mistakes and failures are only those of the clients, unquote. So much for those bad men of the 1920s and 30s. In 1927, Lincoln stepped down as president and was lauded fulsomely for his remarkable 20 year service. Let me tell an unusual anecdote of his tenure. In 1912, the society celebrated its centennial, and Lincoln went all out. Massachusetts Senator Henry Cabot Lodge was to deliver the main address on the timely yet controversial topic international arbitration. But to everyone's surprise, he rose and delivered completely different remarks, a rambling reminiscence of his first trip to Europe as a child. <laughs> what prompted the change was the presence in the audience of a man named President William Howard Taft, who was not supposed to appear till that evening. He, uh, and a Lodge and he were at loggerheads on the subject of international arbitration, so the senator did the polite thing, something that would not happen today, and opted for a less controversial, and from many reports, much less interesting topic. I mean, what would you think that when you came here to hear me tonight, I talked about what I did last summer? <laughs> Civil, if hardly warm. To say they were not alike is laughable. 
They were as different, someone once remarked, as a Puritan and a Cavalier. Brigham could be found here at all hours, on weekends, whenever. On the other hand, staff would set their watches when Shipton left every afternoon exactly at five to return home to Shirley, Massachusetts, where he was a town citizen husband and parent. More importantly, Brigham, he also held different visions of what this institution should do. Brigham thought AAS should continue collecting, doing bibliographical work. Shipton wanted to make the society's already incomparable collections better serve scholars' needs. Some of the older members must have tales to tell of Brigham, but here is mine. In 1931, in the depths of the Depression, Brigham uncorked a bottle of Madeira from a dinner concluding an 1831 public gala that had included the military parade, the 20-member band, and music speeches, etc. Christopher Columbus Baldwin had attended that Worcester County Centennial and recorded in his diary that after all the toasts had been drunk, one bottle of Madeira remained. The celebrators decided that it should be preserved at the society to be opened when another century had passed. As the big day, said on October 14th, approached, Lincoln appointed Brigham Consular Chandler Bullock a committee to plan a celebration, which had to be private, of course, because it was prohibition. Now, Brigg was never one to pass up an opportunity, even with rumored to have liquor run up to him from Rhode Island. So he gave a proper dinner for the council at his home. After dinner, all adjourned to the council room upstairs, an antiquarian hall from which legally the wine could not be moved. It had to stay here. Remember, Thomas Hovey Gage read verses that he had composed to the bottle, which, for mirth and cheer, I'll try to do it with my voice, had been by cruel fate condemned here, a century with books to spend. Gage imagined that this bottle must have wandered around the shelves to find some spirit of congenial mind, but found nothing more convivial than almanacs and cotton matter. Now, with its scented served, its freedom won, it had expected more pageantry and glitter than this little private ceremony. To this expository why we feebly answer, the country's dry. We are told we can't transport you from the antiquarian gloom that sheds its shadows in this room. And it wasn't even possible to introduce the bottle to all members of the council. Gage wrote apologetically for two more teetotalers. We're very sorry, but you must miss our president, Coolidge, and our chief justice, Charles M. Hughes. I'm probably right, I think it is. But sink or swim, live or die, light or darkness, wet or dry, ranks diminish, numbers few, we're here to keep our rendezvous. And they <laughs> But was open, contents found, sound and palatable after everyone had tasted, re replenished it, recapped it, and it will be opened again in 2031. This was actually written up by James Thurber in the New Yorker uh, as one of the interesting incidents of that. Well, back to the new regime, even-tempered, steady, dependable to a fall over his 27 years at the society, shipped and prevailed, radically transforming how the library was regarded. We ought to turn our attention, he said, from collecting and sorting, I'm sorry, from collecting to sorting, arranging, cataloging, preparing bibliographies of the material. He developed a custom cataloging system still used in the back today for the shelving of our books. More significantly, he became interested in new technologies to make materials widely available. Long before photocopying or the internet, Shipton knew where this would lead. The time may come when by the perfection of photographic techniques, everything in print will be available everywhere, and there will be no need for centralized collections of materials like ours. However, he continued, it is apparent that before that time comes, we shall be busier than ever for a generation or two preparing those photographic reproductions. How prophetic. The transformative opportunity came a few years later when Shipton encouraged and participated in the first major technological revolution in photo duplication. Uh, in 1954, the Society signed a contract with Redex Microprint print, to make available in multiple copies new technology of microprint, all of the titles in the Evans bibliography, all of the books printed before uh, 1820 in the United States. To cover its expenses, the society would receive $5,000 a year. 
Brigham called this the most important bibliographical project since the publication of the National Union Catalog. Initial subscriptions exceeded expectations, 60 institutions signed on. People here of my age, if you're working uh, in, in North Dakota, in Kansas, in Louisiana, on early America, you went to a library and you found these boxes with, with tiny little, you can't see, you can even see them without, without the uh, technology of the machine. Uh, and they were filed by date, and you picked out a card, stuck it in your reader, and read, you could read anything printed in the United States. Anything that was here that you could touch physically was there on those cards. It was, it was truly transformative. Shipton worked endlessly, or at least four days a week, on the project, <laughs> correcting inaccurate entries in bibliography, eliminating ghosts, proofreading film, cajoling other libraries to lend items. And the work was completed in 1968, making 50,000 American imprints available. Never before, he wrote, has this library been nearer the center of the midstream of American historical activity. And to the worry that such work would make AAS irrelevant, he noted, he did not expect any of us will live to see the completion of the train of microprinting projects. For when all this is done, he wrote, we shall have exhausted the contents of only one third of the 20 miles of bookshelves in our library. That's what's in the back room here. There was, however, one persistent thorny question. When would Brigham retire? <laughs> As it had been for Baldwin, Antiquarian Hall had become his mistress. As he put it, to live without going to the society would be unthinkable. In 1959, however, after 50 years as the society's leader, he finally told the council that he was stepping down, a decision hastened by the recent death of his trusted assistant, Dorothea Spear, who had joined him in 1923. He had expected her to become the new librarian after Shipton ascended to the directorship. The unimaginable day arrived and the nation's booksellers who made their living through Brig, no doubt, all dressed in black. Shipton eloquently summed up his predecessor's achievements. When Brigham came to the society, Shipton said, we were in crisis, drifting down into the status of a local academy without having achieved the purpose for which Isaiah Thomas founded it. Brigham changed all that and made it a national treasure. At the same time, Shipton clearly set his terms for doing this work. He would step down, he said, exactly nine years from that date, when several key employees reached uh, retirement age simultaneously. In the interim, he wanted to raise the library, as he put it, to peak efficiency. He hired, uh, as his uh, next librarian, a young man who we all love and adore, named Marcus McCorris. In 1967, uh, he had been working in Dartmouth and a few other uh, rare books libraries. Gave McCorris in his marching orders. And I must apologize, um, uh, I have no funny anecdote about Shipton. <laughs> I couldn't find a funny anecdote. But he was, as they say, sui generis. He was a thing of him, though. He was a remarkable man from all I've been told. But um, I couldn't find a, an odd thing. I'm sure some of you could tell me. Uh, I point out now, and to newcomers to this society, what others in this room know. With McCorrison's tenure, I enter frightening territory, the dangerous minefield of writing about those who are still very much alive. But I'll try to be succinct and do it justice. McCorrison leapt into the job, expecting he wrote every inch of 20 miles of bookshelves, every drawer of prints, every box of pamphlets, every corner of the stacks. He linked the learning process to the thorny matter of increasingly um, uh, frequent budget shortfalls, and soon began to deaccession works that he did not think added materially to the society's primary mission, uh, and that was not an uncontroversial matter. He culled such things, for example, as South American material, British imprints, government documents of a certain period. He also worked hard to open collections to new users. As long as faculty advisors recommended them, Graduate students could now use the library and eventually even allow undergraduates, which is uh, the auspices under which I first came here. Uh, he encouraged local programs with Clark, the College of the Holy Cross, the University of Connecticut, and Old Sturbridge Village. But like Greg, McCorriston was also a great collector, called by one associate the Grand Acquisitor. The single mindedness with which he pursued certain books is typical. Here's uh, one thing he wanted nearly, John Hargrove's Weaver's book. 
Yesterday I bought a book for EAS, he wrote a potential donor, which my predecessor, Clarence Bergman, tried to buy 25 years ago. Society had missed a second copy in 1970. Thus, when this copy appeared, McCorson had to leave. This is a terribly important book, he implored the donor, but its price is such that it really does extend my book budget to the breaking point that I need help with it. And I gather this sort of letter was not <laughs> rarely written. Needless to say, he had committed to buy the book before he had the money, but he got the money and we have the book here. Um, this unbridled enthusiasm got him into trouble with the council, as I mentioned earlier about Haven's troubles. And as I mentioned on one occasion, the Houghton Library's Bill Wallen came to his defense. Bill did not like the fact that the council had been berating Marcus for overspending and wrote them. He has a genius for fundraising. He also has a genius for powerful collecting. He has a reputation in the book trade, Bond continued, for knowing what he is about and acting accordingly. And after this higher praise was given, presumably he was put back out into the field. Such matters, though, were exacerbated by the periodic fluctuations of the economy. In the dark days of 1975, McCorris had even considered, this is amazing, whether AAS should become a branch of the Smithsonian or pursue a collaborative arrangement with the Massachusetts Historical Society. Interestingly, the latter's then president, Thomas B. Adams, walked to the prospect, but not necessarily for altruistic reasons. He salivated at the potential financial windfall. Adams would welcome further discussions, he wrote Marcus, about the possible adjoining of our two societies, for there would be the consequent great advantage of selling off duplicates for billions of dollars. AAS and MHS member George Bidspeed must have been waiting anxiously. <laughs> Even more radical was McCorson's suggestion that the society sell off some of its non-print treasures like a set of 18th century dining chairs, Thomas Hart Benton's desk, the Winthrop sword, and paintings. He charged some of his staff quietly to look into this, and they prepared a little known memorandum called the Memorandum of the Family Jewels. <laughs> Fortunately, they concluded that his idea was fraught with legal problems because many of the items had been willed with the understanding that they would be retained. And so the society's jewels went I'm trying to speed it up. Again, I apologize um, for this point of time. The chorus is cultivation of national foundations like NEH and the Melvin Foundation, which in the 1960s began funding institutions like AAS Save the Day. These granting organizations were a new and important source of income, and he jumped at the opportunity to sell them on the society's work. By 1977, the budget returned to positive territory. Um, of course, it realized his dream of a fellowship program that now is perhaps the central jewel in the society's crown. Having brought hundreds of scholars, new and old, to Antiquarian Hall to pursue all manner of projects, the list of publications produced by this cohort is extraordinary. Establishing this program, he developed a whole new way to bring national, indeed international, attention to AAS and created what fellow fellow Scott Casper has characterized in his now immortal phrase as the country's primary research spa. That's what we are. Uh, I'm going to skip ahead. Let me summarize the course of the Let these figures attest to his influence. In 1967, the endowment stood at $3,600,000 with a budget of $160,000. And his retirement is $21,750,000 with an annual budget of $2.1 million. He added an 8,005 foot square foot addition to Adam Grant Hall, acquired the properties at Nine Regent Street, now the fellow's residence, and the Goddard Daniels also across the street. He increased staff to 50 positions. He put a new online computer system built to the society's specifications into operation. He successfully integrated the society's traditional scholarly interests in bibliography and printing history with its publication. Among us here, I know there are enough anecdotes about Marcus to make a lecture in itself, but I must say two things. When I came to AS, I never could figure out why he always called me or introduced me as a Larry. <laughs> well, I finally figured it out. And those of a certain age will get it. 
Obviously, there had never been a girl in Antiquarian Hall, and the only one Marcus knew of was Larry Gora, pitcher for the Kansas City. <laughs> also, let me say uh, that when I think of him, I think of a charming uh, line on a recording I have of Alan Lomax, who news a lot lately, or uh, for his collection he has, was interviewing a fiddler in uh, Southwest Virginia in 1941, and uh, asked the fiddler, you know, this man, Green Leonard, from whom you learned, well, what was he like? And uh, in his Scott Cyrus Brogue, um, Emmett, when he said, well, he was a little singular. Well, Margaret is a little singular. Wonderful man. Not here tonight, but he'll be with us. In any event, we get to the uh, arrival of Ellen Dunlap. She joined the society as president in 1992. She was the first female leader and the first chief executive in more than a century who had not worked in an aquarium hall. To be sure, by that time, uh, other women had held high-ranking positions here. The president of the council chose her with Jill Kirk Conway. The librarian was Nancy Burke. The society had come a long way from its first recorded woman reader, Grace Colton Alvier, 1888. Um, excited about new opportunities for research, from the outset, Dunlap also was convinced that the society's future was tied to the latest concepts of electronic research. Such things depended on new and continuing grant support. And as she began her tenure, the Lila Wallace Reader's Digest Fund stepped in with an award of 750000 for outreach. Uh, it funded new positions, including my friend Jim Brands as director of outreach, uh, and allowed us to begin to have a much larger presence on the uh, World Wide Web. Uh, seven years into Dunlap's tenure, the ever reappearing space crunch uh, occurred. Plans went forward for a state-of-the-art climate control book stack edition, directed by Vice President Ed Harris. This project began in 2001. Behind us was built a 12,000 square foot state-of-the-art book storage vault on two floors with compact shelving that added 30,000 linear feet of storage. Uh, it also has the most contemporary fire suppression system available in seconds. If there's a fire, it sucks the oxygen from the chamber. Not a place for a staff member to go for a snooze. Uh, as the 21st century opened, the digital dissemination of bibliographical knowledge about American books was where the action was. And with Dunlap's guidance and, and the acquisition of grants uh, among comparable institutions, AAS became the major player. First came the marketing of machine-readable catalog cards and the Evans bibliography. Uh, as Dunlap put it, Yankee ingenuity led us to realize there's considerable profit, or should I say cost recovery, to be had in our producing such things for libraries. Next comes the digitization of books and pamphlets themselves. The financial windfall is considerable from 2005 to 2011. A total of $8.1 million came in from digitization projects alone putting the society on sound financial footing. The benefits from digitization were internal too, as major cataloging efforts put more and more newspapers than items from the graphic arts collections and others into the online catalog. I'm going to summarize uh, uh, and tell one lovely little story uh, about something that didn't get into the book. Uh, we just discovered this the other day. I, I had just bought something um, that I needed to do some research on, and I happened to contact the Rhode Island Historical Society, or rather Newport Historical Society, in uh, 1841, when they were collecting things in the catalog for the uh, cabinet, one guy writes to Mr. Haven and says, understanding that your society wanted the printing press of Dr. Franklin, Benjamin Franklin, that belonged to this place, which was sold at auction this day, which I purchased, I will send it to you. Delivered for $10, uh, $10 or delivered at Worcester for $20. Nothing more was ever heard of us. Carolyn and I thought this was utterly spurious. In the Newport Historical Society sits the Franklin Press. We could have had that press and something a little different had come out here uh, with a uh, and secondly, story I brought up telling I belong in this history, although I'm not in it. I am the only person at the American Antiquarian Society who has ever had his car stolen from Antiquarian property. <laughs> <laughs> so let me summarize. That's a true story. 
My time runs out. They are so patient. Let me summarize. For 200 years, the leaders of this society have, with diligence, enthusiasm, and imagination, sought to collect and preserve the historical record of the United States. From the society's founding, when Thomas presented the collection of books that he acquired in the course of writing his history, its leaders have contributed to what we might term the Bibliotheca Americana, the American Library. Baldwin and Haven fostered that vision and sponsored important work on the early peoples of North America as well. In the early 20th century, Waldo Lincoln decided to use the Salisbury Request to transform the life of the society into a library, not a museum. He hired Brigham, a sophisticated bibliographer and collection builder, whose 50 years of collecting were built on the work of Charles Evans uh, and others. Shipton's legacy was his use of new photographic technology to disseminate information about the society's collections. McCorris had had the vision of other modalities for making this great collection widely known and thoroughly utilized. Dunlap has developed such facets of outreach embracing digital technology to open the bibliographical record and its contents to scholars everywhere. As when the Evans cards were published, AAS now is at the center of transformations in scholarship because of these new technologies which it has fully embraced. She took the taters, so to speak. More readers than ever come to the library, and they come with new kinds of questions and new kinds of tools to answer them. The society has prepared its infrastructure and trained its staff to assist them as much as they can, evidencing the same dedication they always have. More recently, for example, a gathering of invited scholars and staff met to consider research libraries in the digital age, anticipating the evolution of a similar blueprint for the society's leadership in this area. I can think of no better way to end this talk than to quote one of my favorite authors, Henry Thoreau, who himself visited Antiquarian Hall and whose journals actually resided here for a while in the late 19th century. I learned this at least by my experiment, he wrote, that if one advances confidently in the direction of his dreams and endeavors to live the life which he has imagined, he will meet with a success unexpected. If you have built castles in the air, he continued, your work need not be lost. That is where they should be. Now put the foundations under them. For 200 years, the society's leaders have dreamed dreams and had the dedication and courage to build foundations for the future. May it be so into the third century.